Welcome to this, our next edition of our daily devotions coming to you from Church of the Palms in Sarasota, Florida. We're so happy you've joined us and we, as always, encourage you to share these devotional times with those that you know and love. Let's begin our time with a word of prayer. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, our scripture today comes from the gospel according to Matthew, the 20th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Hear the word of God. <clears throat> but the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others still standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, well, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do with what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Years ago, I came upon an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer that sort of caught my attention. It had to do with a woman named Catherine Urosti, who was driving down the road near Las Vegas, Nevada. It was a wintry time, and the road was icy, and all of a sudden, she lost control of her car. It skidded off the road, flipped over, plunged upside down into an icy river. Instantly, her upside-down car began to fill with water. Well, with no way to get out and the car filling up with water, Catherine quickly determined that this might very well be the end. But before she panicked, she remembered seeing on television a certain survival technique. She remembered that somewhere in the car, this now car turned aquarium, there had to be a pocket of air. And that if she was going to survive, she had to find that air pocket somewhere. So she quickly made her way to the top of the car, which was now the floor of the car, and groped around for that pocket of air she knew was there, and she found it by the back seat. Now this pocket of air was just big enough to allow Catherine to keep her head just above the water line with the water just lapping underneath her chin. And she remained there for 45 minutes. The rest of her body still submerged in freezing water. It took 45 minutes before anyone came to Catherine's rescue, but in the meanwhile, she just kept her head in that pocket of air. And while she kept her head in that pocket of air, the article said she just prayed and talked to herself and even got to laughing just to keep herself from losing hope. After her rescue, Catherine said that never before in her life has she understood how precious a small thing like a small pocket of air could be. How precious a thing, a small pocket of air could be. I'm not sure when it was the last time I gave thanks to God for a small pocket of air. It is, I suppose, the most frequent gift I receive each day, that small pocket of air that I draw into my lungs, which delivers oxygen to my blood and life to my organs. I don't recall the last time I gave thanks for that little moment of inhalation that I call my next breath, but it comes without me noticing it. As much as my life depends on it, that small pocket of air I will next take into my lungs, it comes to me without my hardly noticing it. Now, the reason I don't notice it is that I have so much more that I'm paying attention to. Now, I'd like to say I'm paying attention to the beautiful weather we've been having or to the migrating birds, or I'd like to say that I'm noticing a faithfulness of a friend or the blessing of my family, but uh, I don't pay 
particular attention to those things. What I'm praying, paying attention to is things like my calendar or the pile of paper that's growing on my desk or the mercurial stock market. I'm noticing all those things that you notice, that knocking sound in your car, the crowd your child is hanging around with, the rumors of the downsizing in your company, the pain you've been feeling in your chest, the burglary down the street. These are the things that we notice, certainly not our last or next breath as much as our lives might depend upon them. What does your life depend upon? Is it your next breath or is it the next appointment? Is it the small pocket of air or the big list of things for, to do? Or is it the expansion of your lungs or the expansion of your holdings? What does your life depend upon? My father was a twin. He was the first of the two to be born. And when his brother entered the world, the attending physician took one look and deemed him stillborn. They set him aside and attended to my father. Well, by grace, an intern walked into the, to the delivery room and noticed the lifeless child and decided to apply some techniques he had recently learned in medical school. And within a few seconds, the little lifeless boy drew in his first breath. And that first breath led to 50 years of ministry, 60 years of marriage, children, grandchildren, and a lifelong brotherhood with my father. Just one breath, and every breath since, is what his life depended upon. What does your life depend upon? Well, I guess it all depends on how you define your life. Has your definition of life changed since as an infant you first drew in that first small pocket of air? Of course it has. To grow and mature is to see life in a much more complicated way. It's to see life in relationship to others and to other people. The list of essentials has changed, likely since we were little babies. We've looked around us and seen what everyone else has or doesn't have, and we have said to ourselves, well, this is what life's supposed to be for me, a little bit more than those people, maybe a little bit less than those people, and maybe just as much as these people. And boy, it just gets complicated when you're trying to figure life out that way. The longer you live, the more complicated it gets, the more standards you have, fit, you have to fit in the, into the equation. The essentials change has gone from our childhood needs of food, air, and your parents' hugs to the keeping up with the Joneses, and it just keeps getting more and more complicated. It seems our lives depend more and more upon the theory of relativity, not the E equals MC squared theory, but the theory of relativity in seeing life in comparison to the people and things around you. So Jesus tells the story about the landowner and the laborers. A landowner goes out and hires laborers to work in his vineyard beginning early in the morning and then hires some more to begin a little bit later and some to begin a little later and then finally he hires some to begin as late as 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And so finally at 6 o'clock when it comes time to hand out the pay, all of a sudden everyone gets a full day's wage. Now, there's something wrong with that, we say. It goes against every capitalist bone in our bodies. It seems rather unfair. The reason it seems rather unfair is that we are employing the theory of relativity. We're saying that a person's worth is only relative to the worth of other people. I can only rejoice in what I have received if someone else can, has received less. I can only be happy with my self-worth if for some reason someone else is worth less. That's always a dangerous way to live. You may not recall the name of Harold Russell. Harold Russell was 27 years old when he got the news that Pearl Harbor had been attacked. He instantly joined the Army, and it was during the training that Harold Russell was handling an explosive device with a defective fuse that went off in his hands, resulting in the loss of both of his hands. Devastating loss. What do you do when you don't have any hands? Russell laid in a military hospital wondering what was there left to his life, horrified at his disfigurement. And then finally came the epiphany, the life-changing thought. He said to himself, or maybe God said to him, it's not what you have lost that matters, it's what you have left that matters. Many of you may have seen Harold Russell, and you probably saw him in the movie that called The Best Years of Our Lives, playing a wounded veteran he won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, and he wasn't even a trained actor. One of only two non-actors to win an Oscar. And he didn't just win one Oscar for the role, but two. The only person to win two Oscars for the same role. 
It's not what you have lost that matters, but what you have left. Life is best lived at its simplest, isn't it? Giving thanks for the little things, which, as it turns out, are the big things. From that first pocket of air we took into our lungs long ago, to the one we will next take, God has given us so much, and the secret of our joy will be found in how much we pay attention to what we already have. Let us pray. Yes, Lord, we thank you for that breath of air that we just took and the one that will soon follow it. We thank you for the basic essentials of life, for food and shelter and clothing and all those things that are so basic. We pray, O oh God, that you will help us to not be so distracted by all the other things, all the things we have or don't have, all the things that others have that and don't have. Help us to get back to the basics, O oh God, to live life in its simplest way so that we can rejoice over what we have and that we can give thanks that you are the God of life who breathes into our lungs each and every moment another breath of fresh air. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.